welcome to the Green Left Report, media for the 99%. I'm Simon Butler. And I'm Mel Barnes. We're filming this show in front of a live audience as part of the official launch of Green Left TV. In this show, we'll be speaking with independent journalist Anthony Lowenstein, author of a new book called Left Turn. And we'll also hear from Carlo Sands, but our first guest is Mike Karadjas, who teaches political economy at Sydney University, and he's an activist with an organisation called We Are All Greeks. Welcome, Mike. Thank you. Mike, in Greece, the people of the country, they didn't cause the crisis, but they're bearing the worst of the impact. Could you just tell us a bit about what the impact has been for ordinary people in Greece? Okay, we're seeing 40% uh, wage cuts, 40% pension cuts. Try and think of these kinds of cuts in terms of if you had to receive a cut of 40%. People are living through times that basically since the Second World War, we can't really imagine in the uh, Western um, Western industrialised capitalist countries. There's no medicines in hospitals. Suicide rates uh, have just skyrocketed. Unemployment is something like 20 to 25 per cent. And we, get, we, we hear things like people who have applied for their 290th job or something like that and then got a, a three hours a week. Is the, the, everyone suffering the same? Of course everyone's not suffering the same because, uh, because the big end of town never suffers. And of course the, the, this crisis was caused by the big end of town in Germany, France, Europe and Greece. So first of all this is not a crisis caused by Greek people, by Greek workers. The propaganda has said the, the Greek workers are lazy and they, they don't do enough work and they just uh, bludge off loans and then the poor Germans have to suffer by, you know, by learning of money and not getting it back. Obviously this is all nonsense. Now Greek workers work longer hours than anybody else in, in the European Union. Um, Greek workers have less holidays. Greek workers uh, retire at a later age. And yet the propaganda we, we're seeing in the media is the complete opposite. This is all mass media lies, absolute lies. So the, the left-wing the, party, Syriza, yeah. they have grown enormously. I mean, they've become the major opposition party yes. um, at the moment. So can you tell us a bit about where they came from? Syriza is, it has grown from a, a strength of having about 4.5% of the popular vote some two, three years ago to 17% in the first elections this year to 27% in the second elections this year. That's, that's the most extraordinary rise for a party that's more or less uh, of the far left. It's, uh, although it, the party itself is a coalition which includes softer left and further left elements, if you like. The main group in it is a group called Sinaspismos, which means left coalition. This left coalition was a very soft left coalition, in fact. Other left activists joined in this coalition and pushed it to the left um, especially throughout the last decade with the anti-globalisation movement and various other movements like that. What also happened was that within the original group, Sinaspismos, the core group, the traditional very soft, moderate left that really just wanted a few piecemeal reforms out of the system, split. And that was most of the leadership. They split away and they formed another group called the Democratic Left, who are now part of the coalition government with the two right-wing ruling class parties that are imposing the austerity. So forget them, it's therefore, it's the left wing of this Sinaspismos with about 10 other groups of the far left. It's the split, it's the coalition with the far left, and above all, it's the movement in the streets. Um, so there's been this most enormous movement. We've had 17 general strikes in, in two or three years. Imagine 17 general national strikes think of that in Australian terms. We've had the movement of the squares, where the squares, the, the streets are occupied by people continually fighting against this monstrous um, austerity program that's being pushed down their throats by the European and Greek capital. Um, and so, of course, this, this party that's, that's been saying no to this memorandum, obviously this is the party that's grown. It's, it's the party that uh, the working people trust. What happens now after the election with this movement on the streets and the fortunes of Syriza? What do you think is the momentum? Is that cut off or will no, go forward? Not at all. I mean, no, I mean, I mean, after the elections, of course, there's a little bit of a pause for, for reflection, but nothing's changed. Whether Syriza was going to ultimately win or not, you know, that wasn't just a matter of, of, of Syriza. Obviously, there was a scare campaign. You know, European and Greek capital said, you know, if you vote for them, if they reject the, the memorandum, they'll be thrown out of the EU, thrown out of the Eurozone, and then they'll be even worse off. Now, for a lot of people, the idea that they could be worse off is absurd. But for a lot of other people, OK, yes, it is a little bit scary. And if you look at overall, the parties, right and left, 
for and against the memorandum, the, the majority actually voted against the memorandum. And so what that means is that this, this government now, which is going to force even harder austerity on the Greek people, essentially doesn't have legitimacy to do that. And in any case, the suffering of the people is so intense that this movement in the streets is not something that someone created. I mean, this is desperation. This is real. This struggle is real. This struggle will continue because it simply has to. So yeah. on the other side of the political spectrum, there's yeah. also been the rise of the neo-Nazi group Golden Dawn. And they won seats in the last election. Yeah. And so how serious is the rise of, of Golden Dawn? Well, Golden Dawn got about 7% of the vote, which is a massive vote for a neo-Nazi organisation. It's, it's not simply a far-right organisation. There are other far-right organisations, and the far-right overall got about 20%. It is extremely polarised, and that is part of what's going on. The, the actual neo-Nazi vote of 7%, we need to understand part of that is the Greek deep state that's existed since the whole post-Second World War period of dictatorship and particularly the, the last colonel's dictatorship in the 60s and 70s. This dictatorship fell, but the deep state, the people in the police and army and bureaucracy, a lot of them remained. Now, one in two police in Athens voted for Golden Dawn. That, that tells us something about the nature of this thing. I mean, in other words, it's two things. Yes, on the one hand, it does reflect the anti-austerity vote of the, of the far right of the people uh, who are desperate and are being won over by the arguments that it's all caused by immigrants and so on. Yes, that, that, that is a real thing. But at the same time, it's also the deep state. Now, there are two struggles. One is the struggle against the regime and the austerity program, and the other is the struggle against the far-right mobilisation, which is violent and which is actually, you know, attacking immigrants physically and so on. So there, th this united front of the left is vital for both these reasons. Thanks for coming on the show, Mike. That's all we've got time for. Yeah. As the 1% increases their hold over the media, uh, you can help spread the reach of alternatives like Green the TV. The richest 1% control the mainstream media, and it's getting worse. They defend their interests. We need media for our side. For 20 years, Green Left Weekly has provided an alternative. Now we're launching Green Left TV. Green Left TV, media for the 99%. Your issues, your campaigns, your views, from Australia and around the world. Green Left TV. Watch it. Share it. Film it. Most of all, we need your financial support. Help us raise $60,000 to make Greenleft TV a real alternative. Donate now. Greenleft TV, media for the 99%. Now we move to Greenleft TV's activist news. The case of Perth's Christmas Carol criminals has come to a dramatic conclusion. Pro-Palestine activists were arrested for singing Christmas carols in a shopping centre. All charges were dismissed and the activist walked free. In what is sure to drive genuine terror into the hearts of Perth shoppers, Alex Bainbridge and Miranda Wood are now free to walk the streets of Perth without even having to pay a fine. A key issue in the trial was whether or not police gave these notorious criminals enough time to comply with a reasonable direction to leave the store before arresting them for trespass. Police told the court that these miscreants were given ample time to leave, which is borne out by this video taken during one of the arrests. Uh, sorry, I missed that. Can we see it again? You have to leave now and shut the camera off. That's it. You've been told to leave. WikiLeaks supporters held a protest to support Julian Assange in Melbourne on July 1st. Assange sought asylum with Ecuador to avoid the, ex the threat of extradition to the US, who want to punish Assange for publishing leaked government documents. It's the obligation of our government to step in and do everything they can to ensure that an Australian citizen and a journalist has their liberty and their safety and their human rights protected to the full extent. The fact that the US government hasn't ruled anything out is, I think, cause for concern. We have evidence that they have a sealed indictment against him, and uh, you can imagine that they're just observing the situation. Thousands of workers protested outside New South Wales Parliament on June 14 to protest the government's slashing of workers' compensation rights. Greenleft TV asked people at the rally what they thought about Premier Barry O'Farrell's move. We're union and we're proud. They care of all of us. His nose is getting longer. Shane Barry, Shane. Shane Barry, Shane. Shane Barry, Shane. Cowardly attacking the, the people that are in a very difficult position to defend themselves. Rot. And all you are governing for is for the fat cats. Go and get stuck. 
New South Wales firefighters held their first strike in 56 years on June 21 against the laws. In a daring protest, they hosed down state parliament from a fire truck. For those who couldn't make it out, people were calling out through the window, spray it through the window. <laughs> <laughs> the government has backed down, granting firefighters exemptions from the new laws. But most New South Wales workers still lose out if they're injured at work and their fight goes on. Australia's mainstream media is in a huge crisis. More than 2,000 journalists and staff at Fairfax and News Limited have just got the sack. Billionaires Rupert Murdoch and Gina Reinhart moving to take on even more control about, about what we see and, and what we hear. To discuss this, joining us is independent journalist Antti Lowenstein. Welcome, Antti. Thanks for having me, guys. How do those concerned about this crisis in the media respond? Some have argued that it's best to ask the government to put more restrictions and more controls on the media, regulation, and others say, no, that's wrong. The answer has to be to promote alternatives. Or, so what's your feeling on what's the best way to deal with this crisis? I think in some ways as an independent journalist, everyone I guess who watches this would want the idea of independent views to be heard. So the idea, for exa example, that if tomorrow, for argument's sake, all of Fairfax News Limited disappeared, I think that would be in the end bad for democracy, not because they're great publications, but because they do provide some information, often very biased information. To me, one of the, the crises at the moment is not really just about in Australia, it's about the idea that globally we have a situation where less and less people are willing to pay for content. And I think the reason for that often is because they don't feel like their, their voices are being heard. So to me, I think the growth of Gina Reinhart, I don't mean in a literal sense, but in terms <laughs> of her increasing power of Fairfax, I think actually is not that concerning in a way. I mean, journalists are saying that um, Reinhart should sign a document that said that independence is maintained. This to me is, is, a, is a red herring. Murdoch signed that before he bought the Times, London and the Wall Street Journal in America. It actually doesn't mean anything. I mean, ultimately, once an owner has control, he or she can do what they want, which is what capitalism basically means anyway. So the idea somehow that Reinhardt signing a document, that's not the issue, is more fundamental about do journalists actually believe in independence? And Fairfax is not independent now. Mm. And the idea somehow that a corporation which aims to make profit is independent is nonsense. It's as independent as the Murdoch Empire is. In other words, it's not. Mm. So the questions to me are far broader than just Rupert or Gina. You've just recently got back from a trip to Afghanistan yeah. and, and Pakistan. Yeah. You wrote that in Australia's media there's a near complete exclusion of Indigenous voices from conflict zones. And so how do you think that that impacts on our understanding of the wars that Australia is waging in those countries? One of the things that I um, wrote about and saw when I was over there, having been to other countries in conflict, is that you rarely ever hear those people who live there, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Gaza, whatever it may be, actually in their own voice. It's almost as if you need to have a journalist who goes there and says, yes, there's a Gazan who says the occupation's terrible. And that's an important role. But there seems a weird sense that somehow I think that a lot of the, the corporate press are afraid of having voices that in some ways challenge their own superiority. So the idea of having an Afghan saying the occupation's bad, the Americans should leave, and I see it as, a, as an ingrained racism. I don't think it's an overt racism necessarily. There's no reason why you couldn't have a Afghan or Pakistani, male, female, in translation, you can actually go to the source and find out what's happening on the ground there. And I think Afghanistan is one good example Although, of course, it's a very poor country and most people don't use Twitter or the internet, obviously. There is, I think, a real opportunity there to hear voices having just been there who are being engaged and supported. And that's, I think, one role that the West can provide. It's not military at all. Certain NGOs or others who can provide training to young journalists, young writers, to have a voice and to use technology in a country which is fundamentally has been ruined both by the West and 20 years before that from the Soviets and the Taliban as well. I wanted to ask you, Anthony, you criticised the Western media and said that it suffers from a journalistic and political culture that rewards loyalty to an establishment, establishment class without accountability. Yeah, I think one of the issues we have in Australia, and it's not unique to Australia, I think it's happening in most of the Western world, is a crisis of authority. It's almost like if you're an insider, that's good. The ABC has arguably the worst show on television, The Insiders, 
which almost defines what bad television is. In other words, you are rewarded by being close to a media advisor or a politician. They believe in a system that rewards being nice to power. So if you're accusing someone like Gillard with a wet lettuce of being a terrible leader, you're not going to lose access to a media advisor who gives you a press release to therefore have in the paper the next day. When it comes to WikiLeaks, I mean, in my lifetime, there is no one that I can think of who has tried to fundamentally challenge the concept of both the role of US power, but also, as importantly, to challenge journalistic integrity. That the reason, I think, in the US and the UK, particularly the UK, there is so much aggression against Assange personally. One, because it distracts him actually what his documents have been saying. And I think secondly, it's because what he does is challenge them. And as he's often said himself over the years, why have I, as WikiLeaks in my organisation, in now six years of existing, had more leaks than every corporate news organisation combined in the last 30? And there's a lot of reasons for that, I think, obviously. So... There's a sense, of course, that when you try and have a conversation with many journalists in Australia, as I do in my weaker moments, about why there is such a rewarding for insider behaviour. That's not unique to Australia, but it's getting worse. I fear that many of those journalists will say, well, if I piss off the wrong kind of people, that's what it's about. It's about access. Mm -hmm. And to me, like Seymour Hirsch, great example. Seymour Hirsch, New Yorker journalist, he's like 75 years old. He's an insider journalist. His journalism is fantastic, it's researched, it challenges in some ways what the establishment does, and yet he remains an insider. But unfortunately, the majority of insider journalism is what you see in the corporate press here every day, which is a press advisor to a politician giving a friendly journalist a piece of news, which essentially is then cut and pasted into a news story. That's what journalism has become. And that's why I think a lot of people in the public, after year after year after year, actually say that journalists are about as respected as used car salesmen. They're regarded as individuals who are untrustworthy. You've just released a new book called Left Turn, yeah. which is a collection of essays about the left in Australia today. Can you tell us a bit about why you decided to write that book and, yeah. and what you're hoping that the left will get out of it? I suppose the idea behind Left Turn really was it's co-edited with Jeff Sparrow, who's the editor of Overland magazine, who's based in Melbourne. It really came out of a few conversations he and I had about two years ago, which was that in the last 10 years, pretty much on every key issue, Iraq, Afghanistan, climate change, the economy, Virtually every single Main Street pundit has been wrong on everything. On everything. And yet despite being wrong, they're actually rewarded for being wrong. We could not think of one prominent mainstream commentator who proudly associates with the left. There are commentators who, of course, sometimes have left views. But ultimately people who proudly stand up and say on a range of issues... I'm not saying I have a car that says no, I'm a left member, but there is an idea somehow that even having alternative views is unheard of. The whole mentality very much is what Margaret Thatcher used to say, which is there is no alternative. Capitalism is the answer to everything, and if it goes wrong, we know we can fix it because it's the only answer. We're not the first people who put out a book about the left on Australia, of course, and the response has been mostly good, except for a very welcome criticism in the Australian, which we're very happy about, of course. <laughs> but I think said something like we had sort of crazy claptrap views about you know extreme issues, including, I might add, on Palestine. One chapter talks about BDS in the context of Marrickville, the PEP syndrome, PEP, progressive except Palestine. And many of us know people, Jews and others, who are on every issue, refugees, they're great. And then when it comes to Palestine, well, you know, it's complicated. It's not that complicated. <laughs> it's actually quite simple. I want to thank Anthony for, for coming and joining us yeah. on the show. Thanks. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Up next, we have Carlos Sands, and he's not happy. <laughs> is, it, is it just me, or is Australian nationalism something that's really quite often utterly surreal? I don't know if you noticed, like recently, our front pages were awash with gushing articles that just because it won a fucking race in England, black caviar, and this is a quote, has done Australia proud. That's quite desperate. Black caviar... <laughs> is a fucking horse. <laughs> Done Australia proud, it doesn't know Australia exists. It does not grasp the concept of the modern nation state. <laughs> Mr. Truly Proud Aussie, Black Caviar, where the fuck is its Southern Cross tattoo? 
Should we be proud as Aussies? Let's look at the treatment of WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange and the Australian media and politicians. Exposes war crimes, faces the threat of jail, torture, possibly the death penalty in the United States, roundly abused as an attention-seeking narcissist. These people must be walking along, see someone drowning and calling out for help, and just call back, oh, for Christ's sake, what an attention-seeking narcissist. It's, it's all about you, 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 isn't it? Let's look at the question of what happens when those who flee the crimes WikiLeaks exposes comes here. Tony Abbott in 2010 went on to Q&A and he was asked, what would Jesus say about the boat people? His answer, now this is a direct quote, his answer was, Jesus understood there's a place for everyone. <laughs> and not everyone's place is in Australia. <laughs> because, as I'm sure we all remember, Jesus' most famous quote is, it's the place of some poor bastards to go get tortured. He went on actually and said, he said, don't forget, Jesus also turned out the traders from the temples. Now I've racked my brain. <laughs> to try and figure out what possible relevance this has to the question of desperate people seeking asylum. And I can't figure it out, but in the spirit of compromise everyone's talking about, I propose a solution. Every single asylum seeker coming here signs a statutory declaration that under no circumstances will they set up any form of money-changing operations <laughs> in or near any of Australia's religious institutions. <laughs> it makes you wonder what version of the New Testament Abbott is reading. I kind of wonder whether in his version, with the story of the Good Samaritan, rather than help the injured Jew on the road, the Samaritan just kicks him and shouts, fuck off back to Jerusalem, Jericho's full. <laughs> but let us not fear because the Olympics are coming up and our government might torture desperate people and invade other countries and commit genocide against the original inhabitants. But a bunch of total strangers will probably swim quite fast, so there's more than enough for us to be proud of. <laughs> I'm Carlo Sands. That's my corner. <laughs>